Savior, Jesus Christ. When our Savior began his work on earth, as our gospel reading has told us, he did so with the announcement, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. For with the arrival of Christ, we are now living in what the Bible repeatedly calls the last days. In these last days, what has God done for you? Has God provided for you? Remember, you are only stewards of God's things that he has given to you. <clears throat> has God's plan for you and for your life been accomplished? Well, the answer is yes. What God had planned for us from the beginning has been accomplished. His Son was born among us, and He lived in our world and shared in our life. Jesus also shared in our death, too. And more than that, He actually died our death for us that we could live. For Jesus delivered us from the curse of the law imposed upon us. And our Savior conquered death. God raised him from the dead and received him back into heaven as Lord and King, where he rules to all eternity. And as he has commanded, repentance and forgiveness of sins be preached in his name. We have been given the opportunity to believe in the gospel by faith. And that faith which we have received has been brought to us under the good and gracious rule of God and made us members of his kingdom. And it is by faith alone we have become righteous before God and are saved. But what, this, but what does all this mean to us? This means for us things are different now. Yes, we can say that things have been very different in our lives as we live in a world of joy, but also, as we know, hardships. But things are different in a most excellent way when Jesus arrived through the gospel message that rises above all other messages, good or bad. Once Christ has broken into our existence with the gospel message, the Holy Spirit kindles faith in us through hearing promises found in the gospel. And this faith lays hold of God's grace in Christ, and through it we are justified. And once we are justified, the Holy Spirit renews us and sanctifies us. So we are here today, as last week, on a wonderful journey with Jesus from our gospel text. For two Galilean fishermen named Simon and Andrew were going to have their lives changed forever. Once Jesus arrived on the scene, things were never going to be the same for these two men. Possibly after the resurrection of Jesus, they might go back and resume their lives of fishermen. But for the time being, they were going to give up their lives as fishermen and try a new kind of fishing. Fishing that required them to go out and evangelize and become the fishers of all people. And so for ordinary people, things were going to be very different. Very different in their lives. Everything in their lives were going to be different when Jesus called his closest followers and said to them, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Yet, things were going to change, and be certainly different. St. Paul says the same things from our epistle reading with these words for today. The appointed time has grown very short. And the time that remains for us, though, fulfilled time, things are different in our lives. Our attitude toward this life is not that of people who are here to stay, but that of people who are on a mission. We live our lives not looking back into the past, but looking forward. And it is about this attitude toward life that makes things different. And 
And St. Paul speaks about this in our text for our epistle lesson, an attitude which recognizes that since we have arrived in faith in Jesus Christ, things are certainly different for us. From verse 31, the Apostle Paul writes, And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. Our passage tells us that we are not to get involved in the form of the world that would have us lose our focus on Jesus Christ, to cause us to fall away from our faith. And like the four fishermen of today's gospel reading, we are to live as those who have been redeemed from the form of the world, as those who have been called to follow Jesus Christ in his mission and toward his goal for us as a church body, the body of believers in Jesus Christ, of a very bright future to life everlasting. Yes, things are different for us by faith. And there are those things in our life which affect us most deeply and touch our human emotions, though. The things which bring us lots of joy, but also sorrow. And Jesus gives us some insight to this also from our gospel reading for this morning. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Things are different for us now that Jesus Christ is in our lives. The things that bring us joy and happiness are certainly gifts to enjoy, it is true, but these are not ends in themselves. But we do not exist in God's kingdom merely to be happy from day to day, but to arrive to the fullness of joy which will be ours when Christ's kingdom arrives in all its joy and it's all its glory where we'll be forever with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus himself. Likewise, the things that make us sad, things that give us a bad day, unexpected sickness, or even grief of death, are not to crush us so far as to drive us to despair, as though everything had thereby reached an end in our lives. No. Well, the Holy Spirit constantly moves our heart because things are different now because we are believers in Jesus by the power of his Holy Spirit. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us first. And this should bring us joy that Jesus had had mercy upon us and has saved us by shedding his blood for us. The prophet Jonah, the subject of today's Old Testament lesson, was a man who had to learn this lesson of joy and grief, certainly the hard way. Jonah knew that those who paid regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. How true is that for us today? Today, idolatry remains a powerful tool that the devil uses to turn us away from God. It has taken many different forms, as you know. And just like from many of our readings from the Old Testament, there are many pleasures of life and material goods that move our attention away from serving God. Trying to achieve these earthly goals or, or buying goods can consume us 24 hours a day. And many would quickly do whatever moral deed it takes to satisfy their desires. Even smaller, more harmless things can twist our attention away from God. It can be very easy to get completely wrapped up in earthly matters in seeking those idols. Well, the Apostle Paul writes about this too. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. He 
Here we can clearly see what is behind idolatry. Things of earth have become great to you and divert your mind and heart from the guiding voice of the Holy Spirit. All too often, the biggest idol in our lives is the one that looks us right in the mirror each and every morning. We are by nature self-involved people. Our thoughts naturally go in one pattern. Me, me, and me. And this spirit, which is promoted by every form of media available today, is the same spirit that filled the devil when he challenged God. And this spirit is horribly destructive, brings world grief, and can only be countered by true humility and repentance. For worldly grief, like worldly joy, is not forever, but is part of the form of this world which is passing away, and to serve, therefore, as a way to keep our eyes fixed on that greater joy, the end of all sorrows that awaits us and those whom we have fished and caught for our Lord, for his great and final revelation. What is true of our approach to family ties and the things of life which brings us joy and sorrow, St. Paul goes on and tells us that it is also to be true of our attitude toward the business of making a living. He writes also, let those who buy as though they had no goods and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. Paul stresses that we shouldn't let life's goals become the marker of ultimate achievement and happiness that our soul should rest on. And Jesus himself illustrated this point by telling the parable of the rich man who was so intent in having financial success that he looked at his crops and he said, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, Drink and be merry, for his goal was finally met. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is what Jesus had begun in his parable with. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. St. John, in his first epistle, would later express this, the idea this way. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. The point of all this is simply to say that with the coming of Jesus Christ, his saving work of living for us and dying for us and rising for us makes us even more certain that things are different for us in our lives today. Aren't they? As Paul writes, the form of this world is passing away. The old goals of life no longer apply. For heaven is our home and this is what we look forward to. What we do in life, our work life, our relationships with one another, are to be viewed in this light. Followers of Jesus Christ, whether they have been found in the first century or in this present age, have been given the grace to repent and to believe in the gospel and now have a new goal in life. God's mission to be engagers of fishers of souls, seeking the lost and strengthening the saved. But the time is short and the world is passing away. And therefore, people should live without being tied to the things of the world, the things that would affect their relationship to Jesus Christ and to secondly, to other people around them. But to always live a holy life obedience to God. In the short time that remains, we who have heard his gracious call should always keep our hearts and minds on Jesus. And we are called to do justice.
just that. By God's grace found in his one and only Son, we are to keep on a firm hold on that full of life to which God leads. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit forever. Amen. We continue with the words of the Arpitory found on page 192 in the Lutheran Service Book. Please rise.